everyone plays some sort of games at some point in their lives. Whether it's playing Pokemon, trying to avoid being tagged on the playground, shooting hoops with a group of friends, playing a video game on your smart board, playing a board game or role-playing a half-elf sorcerer in Dungeons and Dragons. From Mankala to chess, from Kabaddi in India to past the parcel in the United Kingdom, games are a pervasive part of human life. What is a game? What does it mean to play? To answer those questions, we need to learn a little more about the expressive dimension of human culture. Every social activity, from our deepest religious expressions to our most pragmatic actions, has an expressive dimension. Just by living in a house, we learn our society's rules about how space is to be understood, occupied, and used. And living in a two-story American house with a half-acre yard teaches very different lessons about space than living in a Mongolian yurt or in a flat in Tokyo. When you cook meals in that house or outside in the yard, you don't just draw on your cultural codes for what constitutes good food and appropriate styles of cooking to feed your family. As far as the act is social, you also pass on those codes or reinforce them. The same is true if you clean or do home repairs or care for your lawn. This is a crucial way in which culture reproduces itself. But culture doesn't only reproduce itself through the expressive dimension of practical activity. Every society also has specialized activities in which cultural symbols are not enacted through everyday practices but are brought out in special ways. These domains are collectively referred to as expressive culture. Expressive culture is that aspect of the cultural system in which we show ourselves to ourselves. Four common domains of expressive culture include play, myth, art, and ritual. Let's begin with play because, in many ways, play is at the heart of all of these forms of expressive culture. Play is interesting because it's not a defined activity. There's no particular set of features that defines play. Play involves a generalized form of creativity and openness. It's an ability to think about, speak about, and do things differently from how they are done in uh, ordinary social settings. Play is thus less a type of activity than it is an orienting context for action. It's a disposition or a frame toward activity. Any activity can be reframed as a form of play if the right meta-messages are sent. For example, what makes one of these fights real and the other play? The answer is meta-messages, symbolic cues that tell you how you should interpret the action or situation. These meta-messages can be as complex as a formal set of rules, uh, a specified play area or specific objects, or as simple as a wink or holding back a punch so it doesn't really hurt. That said, there are a few features that are common, if not universal, in forms of play in the contemporary world. First, it is usually consciously adopted by the participants. Second, it transforms objects, roles, and actions of the non-play world. A cup of coffee can become playful, or a carved piece of wood can be reframed as a social being by giving it a name and title, a knight, a bishop, a king. Third, Play is usually deemed by its participants to be pleasurable, and these pleasures can take many forms. Erotic pleasure is play that engages the sensual and erotic imagination. Aesthetic pleasures are pleasures that occur when the form of play fulfills expectations based on culturally specific aesthetic codes. Epistophilia is the pleasure of knowing things, especially things that other people do not know or do not know yet. In my own ethnographic work, I found that a lot of kids playing Pokemon, especially early on, enjoyed the knowledge that came with mastery of all of the details of the game and of the different types of Pokemon. Ludic pleasures are pleasures that derive from our surprise, our shock, and our stimulation when texts violate our aesthetic expectations by breaking them or exceeding them. Escapism is the pleasure that derives from escaping from a particular domain of experience, the drabness of your everyday life, the difficulty of your work, into another experience. Moral pleasures are the enjoyment that stems from finding life lessons in play or in texts that uh, apply to yourself or to others. Transgressive pleasures are pleasures that 
derived from play that exceeds social norms to engage your imagination on the level of fantasy or ambiguity. Fatic pleasure is play that allows for extended social interaction and engagement. And nostalgia is pleasure that arises from the recapturing of real or imaginary past experiences. These are not all the forms of pleasure. This isn't meant to be an exhaustive list, but to give you an indication of the many kinds of pleasure that can be engaged by play. Play serves a large number of functions in human social life. Here are just a few. First, play provides an opportunity to imitate the non-play world. Second, play not only allows people to try out alternative roles, but allows the creation of alternative social worlds in which wishes can come true, battles can be won, and good and evil can be clearly distinguished. Third, play offers opportunities for creativity and cultural innovation. Fourth, play offers opportunities to comment on and critique the non-play world. Now let's turn to art. Art is a form of expressive culture that plays with form. Whether visual, verbal, or physical, and most art is a combination of these, art involves play with structures according to cultural rules of aesthetics. Art focuses less on the content of expression than on the form the expression takes, the skill with which the form is rendered, and the aesthetic principles that allow members of the community to judge the art as good or bad. The aesthetic principles of a community may include many different kinds of judgments, including whether or not something counts as art, whether it's good art or bad art, orderly art or disorderly art, professional or amateur, traditional or modern, poorly executed or, or well executed, politically acceptable or illegal, appropriate or inappropriate, sacred or profane, and many, many other distinctions. Myth is often used in everyday speech to refer to something that is not true. But this is not the way it is used in anthropology. Myths are stories whose truth values may be ambiguous, but which have a high socially ascribed authority. Myths are especially valued because of their capacity to explain things. Myths are sometimes classified by the kinds of things they explain. Ontological myths explain how the world is, what kinds of things are possible, what kinds of things people can do, and how they can do them. Myths of origin explain how things came to be the way they are, and eschatological myths explain what they will become and how. Myths can include stories that are taken to be true because they're grounded in sacred or traditional ways of describing things, but they can also include stories that are accepted as true as part of common sense, or grounded in what the local community regards as self-evident. Myths serve a wide variety of functions. One of the most significant is their capacity to offer an important conceptual tool for dealing with the contradictions of human existence. According to the anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss, most myths contain oppositional pairs, the opposition of men to women, the opposition of the natural world and the cultural world, of spirit to body, of high to low, of life to death. Myths work to relate these oppositions to one another in an attempt to overcome the contradictions. In regular human experience, for example, the opposition of life and death is incapable of any earthly resolution, but in mythic narrative, the problem can be overcome in some concrete way. Many religious traditions have mythic narratives that transcend the opposition between life and death, but so does popular culture contain these kinds of mythic truths. For example, Many contemporary horror films encode a mythic narrative that proposes that beings who transcend death are so horrible that death is clearly preferable to eternal life. In this sense, mythic thinking doesn't merely explain and justify the world of now. It offers a virtual realm that describes the world as it might be, but within a framework of culturally specific authoritative symbols. Now let's look at ritual. Ritual is a form of practice that makes cultural ideas concrete through action. Rituals have certain typical features. They're usually set apart in some way from everyday life. They employ socially appropriate, often codified, ritual practices. And they express ideas encoded in myths. In most societies, rituals can be divided into sacred rituals, which are patterned behaviors that link humans and their world with the supernatural realms, and secular rituals, which are patterned group practices intended to express and enact collective meaning. It was in studying rituals that the anthropologist Victor Turner came up with 
his theory about the central function of expressive culture in human societies, which is to reframe activities and experiences. Turner argues that human action has two moods, the indicative mood, which focuses on what things are and how they happened, and the subjunctive mood, which considers what may be, what might be, and, perhaps most importantly, what should be. In a sense, Turner was predicting the distinction that's made by many contemporary scholars of digital media between the real and the virtual. But Turner went further. He argued that interplay between the indicative and the subjunctive allowed us to enter into domains of experience in which we could have virtual experiences at various levels of symbolic significance, without the consequences that would occur if we tried out these actions uh, and overturned these social norms in the real world. When we return to the real world, from our virtual worlds, our social norms, our values, and our identities are usually reinforced by our virtual experiences. But sometimes we return with new ideas and we seek to initiate change. In this view, play, Art, myth, and ritual are aspects of the human capacity to see the world from multiple perspectives, to transcend for a time social norms, sometimes returning with a certainty that those norms are valid and appropriate, but sometimes returning with a new perspective on self and society. And this brings us back to gaming. Gaming is a form of play generated by the establishment of rules that generate situations of indeterminacy and contingency. Gaming allows people to enter into alternative realities, make choices, and receive immediate rewards or consequences for those choices in relative safety. Gaming is like art in that it is defined by sets of socially constituted rules within which one can engage in imaginative play and transformation. It is like myth in that games tend to draw from and use basic cultural truth. It is like ritual in that the myths it explores are performed rather than read or listened to, and the outcomes are contingent, not fixed. This makes gaming an interesting study for anthropologists of expressive culture. In analyzing games and culture, anthropologists think about why some games are social and others are individual activities, the social roles of people involved in games, the goals of games and how they're achieved, how much danger and violence is involved in games, how activities relate to group identity how game activities link or separate different groups. But perhaps the most interesting aspect of gaming is the basic question of what makes something a game. Play, remember, is a matter of framing. Any activity can be rendered as play, and gaming is a form of play that seems to be in infinitely transformable. This has led to the concept of gamification. Uh, changes made to settings or activities or other elements of a situation to reframe it from an everyday activity to something more like a game. Aesthetics, avatars, chance, competition, cooperation, levels, objectives, points, risks, rules, all of these are elements that we associate with games. Not all games have all of these, but all games have some of these kinds of features. And if these features get applied to activities of everyday life, they can make those aspects of life more like a game. Gamification, in a sense, is not game design. It's the application of game elements to reframe non-play activities to be more game-like. This includes activities in marketing, education, training, and many others. The rise of gamification and the emergence of gaming as one of the most common forms of leisure activities around the world is making the study of games one of the fastest growing areas in the anthropology of contemporary life.